Late last year, I was watching the football match between the USA and Iran, and I wondered why I couldn't decide who I'd prefer to win. It was nothing to do with the players or football at all. It was all down to the history between the two countries. I generally support the underdog if my own team isn't playing, but that didn't feel right with what's happening in Iran. But then my small knowledge of the history between the two made me reluctant to support the USA either. I knew it was something to do with a revolution and a coup, but not much more than that. So I wondered how much I didn't know about the history between the two, and if it was possible that the USA is to blame for Iran's problems, therefore freeing me to support Iran. Iran is one of the largest exporters of oil in the world, but to tell this story, we need to look at the period just before it was discovered there. We are in the late 1800s, when colonialism was in full swing. Iran was a large country in Central Asia, and at that time it was called Persia. The USA wasn't involved yet, but Persia had been through several wars with Russia over the previous century, some of which led to the loss of territory. They were surrounded by three empires. Russia, as we've seen, the Ottoman Empire to the west, and Britain, or British India to be precise, to the southeast. Why is that important? Well, the Ottomans were no longer a threat and wouldn't exist within the next 40 years, but Russia getting closer to India made Britain see them as a huge threat to themselves. So the two were rivals. They even went to war over Russia attacking the Ottoman Empire, the Crimean War. As we've seen, Persia was sandwiched between the two. Britain tried the soft power approach to Russia's hard power. They provided relatively cheap loans to the Persian Shahs, which enabled their lavish lifestyles to continue. In exchange, they heavily influenced the government and went so far as to suggest prime ministers to run it. But the true aim was to make British goals easier to achieve. Keep India under the British thumb. That brings us nicely to the point of finding oil. Persia had a habit of accepting money in exchange for the exclusive right to something in the country. This was called a concession. It was a short-term tactic to raise money when needed, and in the early 1900s, they gave a concession to William Knox Darcy, a disgustingly rich British Australian. Seeking to gain even more money, he gained a concession on the ability to drill for and export oil in large parts of Persia. The process was expensive, and even one of the richest men alive couldn't keep funding it alone. He found investment via a company the British government had strong ties to, the Burma Oil Company. Eventually, Knox Darcy sold the majority of his shares as he wasn't convinced he would see a return. A year later, Burma Oil came to the same conclusion and sent the order to stop searching. Just in the nick of time, the drilling team struck oil. This was a key turning point for Persia. They now had a resource which was gaining in value in their own country. But sadly for them, they didn't control it. They just received a small slice of the profits. Even that was pitiful due to the shady practices of the company and the British government made more from Persian oil than Persia did. Persia was marginally involved in World War I, but in World War II, they were front and centre. It was also when they changed their name from Iran to Persia. In the early parts of the war, the USSR and Germany considered invading Iran to deprive Britain of the oil. But once Germany turned on the USSR, it fell through, in so much as it was Britain and the USSR who were invaded, occupied, and changed the Shah. In response, calls of Hail Hitler were heard in the streets of Tehran. Not like they were supporters of the Nazis in the US or UK, right? Fast forwarding to the end of the war, a more powerful group of politicians looked to end Russian and British interference once and for all. They nationalised Iranian oil, locking Britain and BP out, and lived happily ever after. But alas, no. Back, and with their former colony the USA, Britain launched a slightly incompetent yet successful coup within a few years. Now Iran had a new puppet master, the USA. What changed? First, the Shah attempted to implement some social reforms such as removing the law on mandatory headscarves, but alongside the carrot, Came the stick of a dictatorship. Social reforms failed because they came from a dictator, and so they became associated with a tyrant, making them easy to defeat by the more conservative clergy and the growing opposition to the Shah. The arrival of the Americans meant some investment did happen, yet by the 70s, around 20 years later, 40% of the population was malnourished, hardly a ringing endorsement of US involvement. This was despite the fact that Iran was a large exporter of oil, but still there was no real benefit to having oil outside of a select few people in power profiting from it, despite the fact that oil revenues grew massively in the 70s in particular, helping to cause recessions in Europe and the USA as a result. The Shah happily spent the oil revenue on building the largest army in the Middle East, rather than looking after his people. He bought the very best weapons that US contractors offered with a side of some nuclear power station plans. That was from a US program called Atoms for Peace. So it's not hard to see why the opposition grew. Not just from the clerics, but those on the left too. Ooh, a rhyme. Rather than actually change anything for the better, or redistribute the wealth, the Shah created a secret police force that was designed to terrify the population. Imagine, a police force that is designed to oppress the people. The US was in almost complete denial about the situation. 
They didn't really care so long as the status quo was maintained. And then the Shah was diagnosed with leukemia in 1974 and underwent treatment in secret. And it's possible that the treatment exacerbated his tendency to make poor decisions under pressure. By 1978, Iran was on the edge. Protests were growing and an exiled cleric was gaining support in his opposition to the Shah and American interference. His name? Ayatollah Khomeini. With the protesters demanding change, the Shah's forces shot and killed protesters in Jalal Square in 1978, the largest of several cases where the military killed protesters. Those looking for reform realized it wouldn't be possible with the Shah out at this point. It was a point of no return for many. Khomeini presented himself as a moderate, able to bring together the various groups. And with the army unable to contain the protests and strikes affecting the country, the Shah suddenly saw the need to reform. He released all political prisoners, going so far as to invite opposition leaders to be prime minister, anything to slow down the revolution. But it was too late. He knew he needed to leave and fast. Within hours of that, statues of him and his dynasty were destroyed in the streets. But Khomeini wasn't the automatic choice to lead the revolution. Others had been in Iran the whole time and thought they could resolve everything with Khomeini providing a supporting role. Khomeini refused the request and street fighting followed between his rebel army and other guerrilla groups. The army declared its neutrality and Khomeini won. So what did he change? He created a new system of government with himself as the supreme leader, convenient. He also didn't trust the army. It had just turned on the previous state. So he created the Revolutionary Guard to rival it, made up of those same guerrilla fighters used to gain power. There would be elections, but only of approved politicians and parties. The end result was a system that was as brutal as the Shah's, but much harder to topple. But alas, Iran was free of colonial control for the first time in a long time. But just a few weeks after shaking off the USA, there was a hostage siege at the American embassy in Tehran. Khomeini refused to intervene and went on to accuse the USA of colonialism and corruption. Was he wrong? While calling them the Great Satan, or Iblis, a name that has been used at times for the USA ever since occasionally for the UK too. The USSR was called the Lesser Satan, just to make clear they weren't any more welcome after the revolution than they had been before. The hostage crisis was ticking along, including a disastrous abandoned rescue attempt that led to the deaths of US soldiers. But within a year of Khomeini coming to power, everyone's favorite dictator, Saddam Hussein, decided it would be convenient to invade Iran. A war that ended up lasting eight years, thanks in no small part to the USA. How might you ask, could the USA have shaped a war they weren't involved in? Well, they tried to back Iran, who told them to f off, as they saw through the transparent attempt to gain influence over them. They then helped Saddam, despite the fact that Israel, the US's ally, was backing Iran. But by the mid 80s, the USA under Ronald Reagan realized it could make a secret deal to give Iran spare parts via Israel. It had to be secret because it broke the USA's own sanctions against Iran. Remember, they were also supplying Iraq at this time, and so was supplying both sides in the same war. Perfectly normal thing to do. Oh, but it didn't stay secret for long and the news leaked. It caused a huge scandal in the US, with the end result being that the convenient relationship between the two was over, yet again. It's also no great surprise that Saddam didn't trust the USA again. They'd be back for him soon enough though. So what's happened since then? Has the USA left them alone to determine their own path? They could have walked away and seen how things played out, but did they f In 1988, the US accidentally shot down an Iranian passenger plane. A year later, Khomeini died, but it didn't bring about the great changes that some had hoped for. In fairness to the horrible system of oppression he put in place, it was brilliantly designed. Ali Kamet Ali Kamet Kamet Ali Khamenei succeeded him and has been in power since. In the 90s, there were terrorist attacks on US overseas locations such as embassies. Some were carried out by groups with strong links to Iran. And after 9-11, the USA under George W. Bush included Iran in its axis of evil along with Iraq and North Korea. He tried to link them to the attacks, but there's no evidence of that. In the 2000s, it was discovered that Iran had never really stopped the nuclear program from the 70s. The USA no longer liked that idea, changing its tune from the 70s when they were actively encouraging Iran to do it. Years of threats, embargoes and sanctions followed from the US and others until Iran eventually agreed to a deal where they were allowed to have nuclear power but with limits placed on them. But the deal didn't last because Trump being Trump and America being America, he withdrew the USA from the deal a few years later. The US also carried out the assassination of an Iranian general in Baghdad in early 2020. He was considered to be the second most powerful person in Iran after the Supreme Leader. So what do you think? Who's to blame for the problems in Iran right now? Whether it's the Russian wars, British political and economic control, or the Americans overthrowing the popular leader in exchange for an unpopular one, they all played their part in how Iran has turned out. But which of them is to blame? I'd have to say none of them. 
They aren't the ones committing the atrocities and violating the Iranian people's human rights now, but they certainly did help to create the perfect conditions for a regime that would do those things. But ultimately, the Iranian government is the one oppressing, killing and maiming people. So nothing except the removal of that system and government will bring an end to their suffering. They are the true victims of this story. Let's just hope that the USA isn't standing by to lend a helping hand the day that happens.